Assalamu alaikum. This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org slash donate. As little as $10 a month can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtina innaka anta al-alim al-hakim Allahumma allimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima tu'allimuna wa zidna min fadlika ilman wa amalan wa qurban ya arhamar rahimeen Okay, let's continue from where we left off yesterday There was a comment yesterday, someone was asking if Adam alayhi salatu was male and suggesting that the idea of his gender came from the Bible and nothing else uh, No, the Quran asserts that he's a male for many reasons, uh, one of his, one of them is that he is referred to as Abu al-Bashir, the father of humanity. So therefore, male. Another thing is Allah Subhanahu wa Taala when He addresses him in the Quran, He says, "Wakunna ya Adam, uskun anta wazawjika." Or Adam, you, the pronoun for a singular masculine male, right? So, <coughs> without a doubt, he is uh, male, and uh, th- there's no doubt about this. It's clearly. Uh, Clearly mentioned in in the verses of the Quran. Okay, so then where were we yesterday? Adam alayhi salam he ate from the tree, and he was made to descend, right? And we said that the difference is between Adam alayhi salam and Iblis was their attitude, their response. Iblis was, oh Allah, it's your fault. Right? Billah, right? Allah protect us. Iblis was saying this, he was blaming Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his own action, his own choice. None of us are forced to do anything. We all have free will. Right? Yes, sometimes you're in a situation, Allah forces you in a situation. But choices like that, like he performs sajda and he doesn't, that was a choice. He casts the blame outward. What does Adam do? He cast it inward. He said, Rabbana, Zalamna, Anfusna, our dear loving Lord, we wronged our own precious selves. This self, your identity, you, who you should want to protect. Allah talks about this, this nafs. The one who uh, purifies it and allows it to grow, who maintains it. Like a gardener with a garden, you remove the weeds so the flowers can, can, can come. Otherwise, the weeds take over, right? <clears throat> so it's precious. You, you, want, you want yourself to succeed. So uh, he said, وَإِلَّمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا If you don't forgive us, we wronged ourselves. If you don't forgive us, we're going to be destroyed, right? So there's a whole idea in Islam that Allah loves people like this. Allah doesn't need... Allah is all-powerful, perfect, right? The most beautiful, perfect being in existence. He doesn't need anything from us. You could worship him day in and day out all your lives. If you lived a million years, every moment in, in you know worship, he doesn't benefit Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the slightest. He doesn't increase by our worship. Neither does he decrease by our disobedience. It doesn't affect him in the slightest, whether we obey or disobey. All that's actually for us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, <clears throat> you know, what he wants from us are people who are humbled and broken before him, right? And Sometimes, because Allah wants you to get to a place, you're given tests and difficulties. And sometimes the test may be a sin, right? Sidi ibn al one of the great Egyptian mystic Sufis uh, and scholars, he said, رُبَّمَا فَتَحَ لَكَ بَابًا مِنَ الطَّاعَةً وَلَمْ يَفْتَحَ لَكَ بَابًا مِنَ الْقُبُولِ it may be Allah might open the door of a particular act of worship for you, that you can give sadaqah or you do this or you do that, but He doesn't open the door of acceptance, right? So we ask Allah to accept everything we do, and a general sign that something's accepted is that you forget about it. So that super tahajjud you prayed, you know, six years ago on April the sixth, you know, forget about it, right? But something, sometimes it's the smallest things. Right, done for someone, or the smallest act of you know, just saying Alhamdulillah when you eat a meal and you feel, you know what, Alhamdulillah, my, my thirst is gone now, my, my hunger is gone. That is greater in Allah's sight than you know, some of the great things that we do, that monster hajj that you had. So He says, وَرُبَّمَا قَضَى عَلَيْكَ بِذَنْبٍ فَكَانَ سَبَبًا لِلْوُصُولِ <clears throat> And it may, it may be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees that you commit a sin, you might end up in a situation where you're doing something time after time 
And yes, you know, we don't want sins in our life. We want to get rid of all of them, right? But you being in that situation, he said, it, it may be he decrees that you commit a sin, but that sin is the reason why you end up in his presence in the end, or you end up being close to him in the end. Why? Because you do that sin, and you know you fall into it, and then you say, Oh Allah, I'm sorry. And then you fall into it, and then, Oh Allah, I'm sorry. And you fall into it, Oh Allah, I'm sorry. Uh, one of my friends, Sheikh Hatim, he was saying to me the other day, um, he teaches a course in Tawbah, and he was saying that, uh, SubhanAllah, if you commit a sin, and then you make a tawbah, it's wiped away. It's like you never did it in the first place. But this is great. But he says, sometimes people commit a sin, <clears throat> and then they do it again, and again, and again, and again, and again. And what is this in reality? It's an opportunity. The believer is intelligent. The believer benefits from everything. So Allah says, <coughs> Inna Allah yuhibbu tawwabin. Allah loves, and you know what love is, this deep emotion. Allah loves those people who constantly say, Oh Allah, I'm sorry, I messed up again. Oh Allah, I'm sorry, I messed up again. Those that do it time after time after time after time, Allah loves this. And you're not going to make tawbah if there's no sin, right? So even that, even when you slip up, that's an opportunity to, to do, you know, to get closer to Allah. And, you know, so this attitude of being lowered and humbled before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, this same Sidi ibn Atayla, he's, he's got, he said, رُبَّ مَعْصِيَةٍ أَوْرَثَتْ ذُلًّا وَانْكِسَارًا خَيْرًا مِنْ طَاعَةٍ أَوْرَثَتْ عِزًا وَاسْتِكْبَارًا How many a sin there is which leaves the person broken inside. I can't believe I did that again, right? How many a sin like this is better than a good deed which leaves the person, I'm so great, right? Look how great I am. I've done all this worship. I've given so much sadaqah. Allah doesn't like that. Why? Because that's how Iblis was. Right? I am so great. I am better than him. So, rather how it is, one of the most beautiful du'as of Ibn Atta'illah, he says, Ilahi, hadha hali la yakhfa alayk. My dear Lord, my dear God, this is my state. It's not hidden to you. Wa hadha, Allahumma, wa hadha dhulli zahirun bayni yadayk. And this is my humiliation right here in front of you. You can see it all, right? Fahdini bi nurika ilayk, so guide me to yourself, and th these sorts of things. So this is the attitude. So Adam alayhi salam did not have this, right? So that's why he rose. And Iblis, you know, plummeted because he had the opposite of, you know, th 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 this quality of humility. <coughs> okay. <coughs> so we said that Adam, he wasn't deliberate. And one of the proofs of this is that uh, sometimes when you put in a situation, <coughs> Allah wants that for you. And although He doesn't like sins, there's situations that Allah has chosen for people. So <coughs> there was a debate, right? People that love debates. There was a debate in the Barzakh, right? Who had the debate? The Prophet Musa and the Prophet Adam, alayhim as salatu was salam. So <laughs> Sayyidina Musa, you know, he's got a, uh, he was a firm man. So he says, so there's a couple of narrations, but anyway. So he says, um, are you Adam? He says, yes, I'm Adam. He said, okay, you're the one who Allah bro breathed that special soul into when he first created you. And he made the angels do a sajda to you. And he taught you the names of all things like we talked about. And he said, are you not? He said, yes. <clears throat> he said, who are you? He said, I'm Musa. So then Musa, he, he said, he said, Adam said to him, you're Musa of Bani Israel. Allah spoke to you from beyond the veil. And you know, he mentioned a few things. And then, uh, and then Musa says, what made you do this thing that got us all kicked out of paradise? So he's blaming him. Had it not been for you, so he says in, in the other narration, you took us out because of your mistake, you took us out of paradise. Had it not been for you, we'd have been in there, right? And then, <laughs> and then you made us miserable life. We've got this difficult test of life. So then uh, uh, Adam says to him, Atulumuni ala amrin qad katabahullahu alayya. Are you criticizing me for something Allah had decreed for me? Allah wanted this to happen in order for us to go to earth, to gain all these benefits, all these rewards, for all this worship and difficulty and patience and everything, right? Allah wanted this. So why are you criticizing me for it, right? Meaning it was out of my hands. So obviously you don't. You don't say, well, I've been, it's been decreed that I, I eat this bacon butty and you go stick in your mouth. You don't, that's not how it works. But usually, you know, like I said, you're in a situation, Allah makes things happen, right? <coughs> so, so anyway, Adam came to earth, had children, whatever, and Allah, uh, 
there is a narration that when Adam was first created, Allah showed him all of his descendants. Every one of us was shown to him. And so a couple of things happened there. He was really impressed when he was seeing the Prophet Dawood, alayhi salam. And he said, oh Allah, give the lifespan you'll give me, give 50 years of that to him. Give him a boost, right? So, and Adam forgot about this when he died. So when the angels came, they're like, it's time. He's like, no, it's not. You know, this happened. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminded him. So he was given, anyway, so at that point his death came. But when he was going through all of these things, all of these people, he said, oh Allah, you've made people different. Some are tall, some are short, some of this, some of that, the different things. Why? And Allah said, I did this because I love to be thanked. No one's got it all, right? The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa right? But beyond that, it's like everyone has something you look at, think, oh, you know, that would be nice, right? But what you see in yourselves that others don't have, Alhamdulillah. That's, that's the great thing about this, right? So anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, when the last moments came, he said to his sons, I'm craving, right, uh, the fruits of paradise. So what happens? His sons go off. And it's as though his sons, it's as though the uh, people in that time um, would meet the angels. They'd see the angels or whatever. <clears throat> and so his sons went to the angels uh, but the angels have come with perfume and they've come with cloth and they've come with, you know, pickaxes and everything. And they said, oh, children of Adam, what, where are you going? They said, our father's ill and he wants the fruit of paradise. So, you know, um, so they said, go back. Your father's passed away. Right. So, like I said, the very first people, it's not known what you do when someone dies. Right. First death. So when Hawa, his wife, saw them, she recognized them and uh, sorry, he was still alive at that point, and she goes to Adam, and Adam says, Just, "You know, uh, you know, uh, leave me. Let, let let the angels take me. I want to go to my Lord." Anyway, so he passed away. They washed him, they dug the grave, and they buried him. And then they said to his descendants, "This is your sunnah. Right? This is how. You, this is what you do uh, with your dead." So that was the end of Sayyidina Adam. The Quran also mentions a story about his two two of his sons. The actual, <clears throat> there's, there's, a, there's a discussion amongst the ulama of how, you know, what, what the cause of this event was. Um, there are a few narrations, but let me, the, the one that Imam Al-Qurtubi and others mentioned is that, okay, so, um, now this may seem weird and it should be, you know, but every generation had their own sharia, their own law, right? And what's right is from Allah and what's wrong is from Allah. So they said that, Adam alayhi salam, how did from two people you get six billion, seven billion, right? So they, they would have a pregnancy. Hawa would have a pregnancy and she'd give birth to twins. One male, one female, right? And then another pregnancy, another pregnancy, another pregnancy. And so they had multiple pregnancies, multiple sets of children. Each twin that was born was not allowed to marry the other, obviously, right? But each, each male from one set could marry a female from another set. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's how, obviously, it spread. So, the, narr the narration is there were two sons, Qabil and Habil, right? So, Cain and Abel, as they say in English, right? And um, Qabil, the one he wanted to marry, he didn't want to marry her. He wanted to marry his own twin, something like this, right? And so, anyway, what happened is he got into a bit of an argument with his, with his brother, with Habil, and... They said, let's let Allah decide. And in that time, what would happen is they would make a sacrifice. So Qabil uh, was a, a farmer. So he got all his crops, whatever, and put it in the spot. And Habil was, um, he had sheep and goats and whatever. So he slaughtered the sheep and he put it in a spot. And the sign of acceptance was that a fire would come from the sky and it would burn the accepted thing. So Allah says, What alayhim naba abnay adam bil haqq? And recite to them, O Messenger, the story, the great consequential news, which is surrounded with wisdom uh, uh, to these people. The context of the surah is Bani Israel and their treachery and their betrayal and all of these things, right? So he says, when both of them put forward a sacrifice, فَتُقُبِّلَ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا وَلَمْ يُتَقَبَّلْ مِنَ الْآخِرِ So he was accepted from one of them and he wasn't accepted from the other. قَالَ لَأَقْتُلَنَّكَ So Qabil, he said, the bad one, let's say that. He said, I'm going to kill you. I swear by God, I'm going to kill you. So he's going to kill his brother over this issue, right? It might not be this issue, it could be something else, but generally the, the ulama mentioned this. So, 
his brother said, إِنَّمَا يَتَقَبَّلَ اللَّهُ مِنَ الْمُتَّقِينَ Clearly, Allah only accepts things from those who have God-fearingness, right? And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for taqwa, right, in every aspect of our lives. Sayyidina Abdullah ibn, uh, ibn Abbas was, uh, he gave some charity once, and <clears throat> and someone said, you know, you know, congratulations, you'll get all this reward for it. He said, if only I knew it was accepted, right? If, when, if one prayer was accepted, it'd be sorted, everything would be fixed. But anyway, we ask Allah for his generosity. So he says, um, so he said, I'm going to kill you. So he said, Allah, why are you going to kill me? What have I done? Right? You're the problem. You don't see that your actions are wrong. So therefore your uh, sacrifice wasn't accepted. Is this film familiar? Yes, exactly like Iblis. Blaming someone else, not taking responsibility. So he says, <coughs> so he says, لَإِن بَسَطَّ إِلَيَّ يَدَكَ لِتَقْتُلُنِي If you stretch your hand out to kill me, I will not stretch mine out to kill you. You want to kill me? Go for it. Right? So the ulama said, so, so, uh, so he says, إِنِّي أَخَافُ اللَّهَ رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ I fear Allah, the Lord of the world. Right? Lord of everyone, I fear Him. Why? Killing is a huge sin. Because, and the proof of this is right after this section, <coughs> that we're going to end up, the very next verse, min ajli ذَلِكَ katabna. Allah said, because of that, we decreed that whoever kills a soul, it's as though he's, he's uh, killed all of humanity, right? And whoever saves a soul, he's saved all of humanity, right? Alhamdulillah, I've saved all of humanity twice. <laughs> I've been in a situation where people got choked, so I did the Heimlich maneuver three times, right? So you all owe your lives to me. <laughs> okay. So he says, if you stretch, stretch your hand out to kill me, I'm not going to do it. I won't do the same to you. Right? Then he says, I want... So you have to understand this one a bit carefully. Uh, so he says, uh, Allah, I want you to end up with my sin, ithmi or ithmic, and your sin. What does this mean? What he's basically saying is, you know, like if someone says, oh, I, I want to die as a shaheed. Right? If someone wants to die as a martyr. Right? What does that basically mean? You're going to be killed by a kafir. Right? So that's the, the basic understanding. Right? So he's saying, is when you wish for that, you're wishing for this to happen. So he's saying, well, I want, I want uh, you to have your sin, which is your initial... So there's two ways of understanding it. His initial intention, bad deed that he did, because of which the sacrifice was accepted, and, uh, and then this sin, his sin, uh, Habil's, for him saying, I'm going to kill you. Or the other way you can understand it is, I want you to have your sin, which you're going to get for killing me, and my sin, which I would have got if I killed you, right, in retaliation, right? So then he says, uh, min ashabin nar. So then you'll end up of the people of the hellfire, right? And that is, uh, that is the, the recompense of the wrongdoers. So, Immediately he's responding to him, look, Allah will only accept from the muttaqeen. I'm not going to kill you. Basically, you're my brother. Why would I kill you? Why would you even want to kill me? So one reason, we're brothers. Second reason, it's because of your own deeds that your sacrifice wasn't accepted. Third reason not to do this is you're going to get my sin, the sin of you know what I would have got if I tried killing you, you'll get that on your own. Don't do this. But sometimes what happens, people see red, right? And they don't think and you just jump into a situation and he does this. So, but what's beautiful is this word, he said, فَطَوَّعَتْ لَهُ نَفْسُهُ قَتْلَ أَخِيهِ He says his ego uh, wrestled with him and fought with him. تَوَّعَتْ تَوَّعَ basically means to make something malleable, right? Something malleable, you make it into the shape that you want. But the wording suggests that there's loads, lots of to and fro in his head. No, he's my brother, I shouldn't kill him, but he's done this, how could I ever let him get away with it? And all of this stuff going on in his head, and then eventually, he gives in. Fine, I'll kill him, right? So, you know, we all have this struggle with things, and so, but he, he gives up, he doesn't decide, you know what, it's wrong, no. So he goes and kills him. فَأَصْبَحَ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ So he ended up as one of the truly, uh, the, the losers. And the Prophet said, so there's a thing in Islam, anything you start of the good, you get its reward, and anyone else who does it will get its reward as well, and you'll get theirs as well, right? So you get your own, and everyone else that does it. Anything bad, same thing. So the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that he, Qabil, will have a share of everyone else's punishment in, the akhir, in, in hell. Anyone who's wrongfully killed another, he gets his uh, punishment. So, and then he says, what happens then? So maybe this was before Adam, yes. 
how how does that make sense? So like, if any like obviously like he's like the start of creation. Yeah. So of his children. He has got a lot of sins. So like, is that the same for people that kill one another in this world? Like they have like, their own sins. If you like, if they have kids and then their kids kill someone else, will they have like the same sins? No. What you're saying is, any murder that happens, the murderer gets the sin, and he gets a bonus sin. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like basically someone comes into Bradford and whatever starts off a new trend that's wrong. Yeah, you know, introduce the drugs, whatever, in a particular area, and he's giving it out, and then loads of people getting addicted and doing this and doing that. So he gets the sin, yeah, yeah. and then everyone else whoever takes that drug and whatever gets the same sin. Yeah, it's like that. So then, like I said, first people maybe it was before Adam, and now he's like, oh my God, what am I going to do? There's a corpse here. And he's also feeling bad about this. So we see that he feels bad later, but not because he, com he killed his brother, but because he's put himself in a messed up situation. And there's a difference. He, Allah, at the end, Allah says, For مِنَ النَّادِمِينَ He ended up as one of the, those who are in regret. And the Prophet used the same word, النَّدْمُ tawba. This remorse, regret is tawba. That when you turn back to Allah, oh Allah, I'm sorry, he's feeling bad about something, this is tawba. But you have to feel bad about, I broke one of Allah's laws, I disobeyed him, I, you know, I did something wrong. Not, oh my God, I'm going to get messed up now. I'm in a tough situation. So Allah sent a crow which starts pecking at the ground and moving some of the soil away. And he's like, oh my God, you know, I wish I was dead. He's saying, ya waylati. You know, I can't even do what this crow can do, you know. I didn't, I didn't even know about this, right, you know, so, so I could bury my brother. So he ends up burying him. And that's his problem. So th right there, Allah is showing right from the very beginning, every one of us has the capacity to go either way. It's your fault. Why should I, you know, why should I do such to, to him? I'm better than him. Or, oh Allah, I'm sorry, it's my fault. Yeah? And Allah loves this response. Adam's response. So even his own sons. And then there's also, there's also lessons as we see with Sina Nuh next that. You know, it's not who you're related to or who you're connected to, whatever. You know, guidance comes from Allah. You have to ask Allah to guide you. And, you know, subhanAllah, sometimes people closest to people that are close to Allah um, don't always benefit from that. So, next we have the story of the Prophet Nuh, alayhi salatu wasalam. Nuh, alayhi salam, is a very interesting individual. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers, to, um, he says, إِنَّهُ كَانَ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا he was truly, really, really grateful slave. And this is, this is what Allah wants from us, right? To be really grateful slaves. So, who is Sayyidina Nuh? So, firstly, he's the first messenger. Adam Islam was a prophet, Mu'allamun, uh, Mukallamun, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he was spoken to by Allah, and he was taught, so he's a prophet. Um, and then his children, his descendants carried on, and then Nuh, Alayhi Salam, came. How long... You know, what was the, uh, the time frame between them? There's nothing certain. We don't know. The question is, how long have people been on earth? Allah knows. Right? Allahu A'lam. Uh, there's nothing. But it's not 6,000 years or whatever like it is in the Bible. It's, it's much, much longer. I read this article a couple of years ago that they found some homo sapien bones in a cave in, uh, in Morocco. Right? And they were 300,000 years old, you know, the carbon dating they do, at least, right? So people have been around for a long time, right? Maybe a million years, we, who knows, right? So anyway, Ibn Abbas, Abdullah Ibn Abbas, the cousin of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who's known as, he was pretty much an encyclopedia of the Qur'an, he said there were 10 generations between Adam and Nuh. What's a generation, right? So in, in our times, the Arabs call, because we're using the Arabic language, the Arabs call a century, a century, a generation because anyone that's alive today will probably you know live to about 100 whatever if they have a good long life right after that most of them will be dead so they call it a century but with Sayyidina Nuh alayhi salam how long how, how long did he live 900 years 950 years anymore you're close right <coughs> Allah says in Surah Al-Ankabut وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ we sent Nuh to his people and he remained amongst them a thousand years minus 50. So 950. But this doesn't... Right? The next 
the verse continues saying that the, the the flood and the storm it took them you know they were destroyed in it so he obviously lived after that as well after the flood he was still alive so more than 950 and usually prophets are given prophethood 30 40 years of age so maybe you know 1050 years something like this right so around the millennium <clears throat> 10 of those so you get what 10,000 years right so he was around for roughly that long uh, that long or more and when, did Allah, when does Allah send messengers? When there's a need, when people need guidance, right? So, what happened in these 10 years, right? Allah says, 10,000 10, years. He says, wahida. Humanity was one group, right? And then they started to differ, especially matters of religion. So Allah sends messengers to guide them, to bring them back to all of this. What happened is, Shaitan, as we said yesterday, you know, he's got, he's got the longest life of any living being. And he, he tricked people. <clears throat> he works in stages. So they, there were some righteous people, right? Uh, Wad, one of the names Wad, Suwa, Yaguth, Ya'uq, Nasr. These five individuals were righteous people of, uh, uh, of the time of, of Sayyidina, uh, after Sayyidina Adam. What happened is they were righteous and they would encourage people to do good. When they died, Shaitan came whatever form, inspired people that these people were good people maybe you should make some statues to remind yourselves of them and they're good they're like, yeah, great idea and because it's the first time it's happened you know, who's to suspect anything but he's patient, right we'll give him that so they made these statues and then he left and then when the people that made them when they died and then when people after them came and they died and then, you know people forgot what these statues are and what they were there for so at that point, he's like, oh, these people are good, you know, or these statues are good. They can help you. They will keep harm away from you, worship them, right? So that's how he brought, um, he brought uh, idolatry into humanity. And literally what happens is you have the descendants of Adam and the ten generations and you get to Sayyidina Nuh. And then most of humanity is dis destroyed, right, in the flood. Just a few, very few people remain, right? And then from there humanity, you know, uh, starts off again. So we're all descendants of Adam and we're all descendants of the Prophet Nuh. So we're all descendants of these two prophets. So his story is mentioned in a number of surahs and we can look at his, his, uh, his story from some of the surahs as we go along. But one of the most painful ones is the, the story of Surah, uh, surah Nuh, his own surah. He's, he's pouring his heart out to Allah. Oh Allah, I did this and I did this and I used this trick and I used this technique and trying to guide them and I said what about this and what about this we look at all these things and they still don't in fact وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا kubara, right look at this so they, they made a plot against him right so that's a makr so then he says وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا and normally if you're just trying to explain you say مَكْرًا كَبِيرًا right they made a big plot but then he didn't use that word he used a strong and in the next strongest word in Arabic just listen to the sound kabir to kibar he didn't use that word. Right, the sound is full of it and it's like there's repetition and all of this stuff in there. So he's saying they made a plan against it. So what happened? He said, We sent Nuh to his people. Now this structure, there's a pro, uh, surah called Surah Al-Shu'ara, right? This surah of the poets. And Allah talks about many prophets, Hud and Salih and Shu'aib and all these people. They went and they say the same thing, right? They go, فَقَالَ And he says, Oh my people, worship Allah. You have no God besides Him, right? They all said this and they all rejected. إِنِّي أَخَافُ عَلَيْكُمْ يَوْمَ عَذَابَ يَوْمٍ عَظِيمٍ I fear for you. I'm afraid, not because of something happening to me, I'm afraid something bad will happen to you on this terrible day, right? So Sayyidina um, uh, Nuh is doing this. Um, Allah says that, He says, Ya Qawmi, oh my dear people, remember that his relatives, uncles, aunties, whatever, all these people, my people, inni lakum nadir mubin. I'm a clear, clear messenger to you, clear prophet. It's obvious I'm a prophet, the way he is, his lifestyle, everything, right? And which is why uh, Allah, Allah describes his wife, he, uh, Allah says about the wife of the Prophet Nuh that she betrayed him and the wife of the Prophet Lut that she betrayed him, right? So this betrayal isn't something like, you know, um, 
some have suggested that you know sexual that you know some sort of affair it doesn't mean that it means that in iman right because they would have known that he's a prophet living with someone like this and the way he is his conduct his deeds everything it's clear he's a prophet but yet they rejected you know um Nuh salam's wife would go and tell people he's crazy, he's insane. She'd say all sorts of stuff like this. And like we said last week, Lut alayhi salam's wife, because um, they were sodomites and they would rape people. So they said that uh, they said to Lut alayhi salam, if any guests come to you, you best watch out, right? And so he got some males, and they were angels, right, who'd actually come to destroy them. And she went and told her tribe, because he married into the tribe, she went and told her tribe, oh, he's got guests in today. And so they came to try and rape these people, right? So uh, Allah destroyed them. So he said that they, they betrayed them. So he says, uh, worship Allah and, you know, have God-fearingness and obey me. These things will get, you know, will you, you'll succeed. And what happens is in the surah, Allah mentions a number of things. So this is one, one beautiful point. يَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ مِنْ ذُنُوبِكُمْ What happens if you obey, uh, worship Allah, have taqwa, and, uh, and you obey the Prophet, right? He says, he'll forgive many of your sins. It could mean all of your sins, from, from first to last. That's what the wording can, can suggest. ila ajalin musamma, And he will extend your lifespan. Right? You would have lived up to this point, but now he said, you know, he'll extend it even further uh, to, to, to a further point as a reward for obedience. Right? He'll give an extended lifespan. Why? And then he says, Inna ajal Allahi jaa la yu'akhar. Because when Allah's decree comes, nothing can change it. Right, when Allah decides you're gonna die, that nothing will change it. But if He decides to extend it, you will. Right. So we talked about this uh, in the Aqidah class about the qada uh, mubram and the the the, the qada muallak that with destiny, with the things in life, there are certain things that are going to happen. The day you're born, the day you you know. Uh, X event, X Y event that happens in your life, that's going to happen. Then there are certain things. It's in the Lawh al Mahfud. It's written both ways. If he makes a du'a, this will happen. If he gives charity, this will happen. Otherwise, the other option, right? So he's talking about it like this. If you obey, you you know your lifespan will be accept, uh, uh, extended. And you know we, we we really see this over and over. We say the Nuh that this is how he's um, uh, talking to people. This is how he's talking to his uh, followers. Allah. Let's just look a little bit at his style. What does he do? He, how does he talk to people? So the first thing he does is targhib, which we talked about yesterday. He goes encouraging people, right? Prophets, when they come, they come uh, with good news, right? Every prophet is a bashir, right? Someone that's come, look, Allah's got this waiting for you. And if you believe, man amana wa amila salihan wa huwa mu'min min dhakrin untha fala nuhiyannahu hayatan tayyiba. Whoever believes, male or female, and does good deeds, will certainly make him live a really beautiful life, right? Allah promises this, right? And then, so, uh, they come with good news, but if they don't believe, then you need a smack, right? So then there's a threat of, you know, the threatened. So let's, let's just, so he said they use targheeb, right? And then he used tahbib, right? He makes Allah beloved to them. Just like what we talked about earlier in the tafsir class, that you know, Allah has done this for you, and Allah has done this for you, Allah has done this for you. When you keep seeing someone keeps doing something for you, you fall in love with them. And then he uses tarheeb, uh, sorry, tarheeb. Look, if you don't, you've got this problem coming. Right? Punishment. Save yourselves. He uses proofs. He, he talks to them in secret. He talks to them uh, openly. And he talks to them in, in daytime, nighttime. <clears throat> Let me just explain one verse, and then we'll, we'll end it. He says that, قَالَ رَبِّ إِنِّي دَعَوْتُ قَوْمِي لَيْلًا وَنَهَارًا My Lord, I called my people and invited them night and day. So it's a 24-hour job for him. It's why? And remember, this is happening for almost a thousand years. Can you imagine this, right? This is, we'll touch more on this uh, tomorrow, inshallah. But this is, you know, something significant. He said, for a thousand years, I called them, uh, فَلَمْ يَزِدْهُمْ دُعَائِي إِلَّا فِرَارًا And my inviting them to you, the only thing that actually increased was how much they ran away from you. Right? And then he says, وَاسْتَغْشَوْ ثِيَابَهُمْ No. وَجَعَلُوا أَصَابِعَهُمْ فِي آذَانِهِمْ They put their fingers in their ears. Why would they do this? Why do you put your fingers in your ears? To not listen to someone. Can you put your fingers in your ears? Give me a practical demonstration. That? No. What the wording means, because there's hyperbole, is literally that. That's your fingertip. They shove the entire finger into their ears. 
because they don't want to hear what he has to say, right? All the way in, obviously hyperbole. They take the clothes and they cover their ears, they cover their heads. It's just foolish, childish behavior, just so they don't have to listen to him, right? As another verse suggests that Allah describes uh, Quraysh, how they would flee from the Prophet as wild animals running from a predator, right? And so this is the attitude, this is what they, the way they, they behaved. So we'll continue from here tomorrow, insha'Allah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit seekersguidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit seekersguidance.org slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.